Dr. Bell, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jeremy, and uh, welcome back. Uh, so we've had a, you know, an amazing first day of the conference, some great panels, and we're gonna cap it off with a, uh, an opportunity to hear an authentic voice uh, from a veteran, uh, Dr. Z. Anthony uh, Krasuski, Tony. Uh, we also had hoped, uh, I'll mention though, to have another veteran with us today, uh, Jim Deal, that's why we called it We Were There. Uh, unfortunately, it's, I was there now, but uh, Jim's uh, back home celebrating his 100th birthday and unfortunately wasn't able to travel, uh, but uh, a veteran of the, of the Ardennes campaign and uh, what, uh, interesting contrast. But um, nonetheless, we've got an incredible uh, uh, comrade here. Uh, you know, uh, Tony's got a great story. Let me give a quick kind of rundown of his bio because I think it'll help some of you kind of understand the context but also then you'll go, oh, I want to ask him questions about that. So what we'll do is we'll have a conversation here and then we'll open it up for the audience uh, Q&A. Now, Tony's, uh, uh, you know, somebody may want to ask him, you know, on, on September 3rd, 1939, he was literally outside the British Embassy, uh, you know, waiting in, in Warsaw, waiting for the, the British and the Poles to not only declare war, but also to intervene in the war in a substantial way. Um, you know, a bit of a cause of disappointment, but, but then as a, as a teenager, um, is in a, a scouting organization. Now, I've, I've been a, a scout leader before, uh, uh, but this is not the kind of a Boy Scout organization you would expect. Uh, and instead, uh, by the time of the, of the Warsaw Uprising, is actually a leader of 100, uh, 100 scouts, uh, so, you know, the, your, your average 15-year-old company commander. Uh, you know, unfortunately, our, our high school students aren't here today because I really wanted to, to kind of give them a sense of, you know, think of the enormity of that and, you know, was, was part of the, 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 the Warsaw Uprising uh, for 63 days. Uh, it's got some, some harrowing uh, stories there, uh, you know, with the home army and, and miraculously, uh, you know, becomes a prisoner of war. Uh, and then, you know, that in itself is, a, is an exploit and then uh, liberation. And, and then we'll, we'll become part of the Polish army in the West with the second Polish Corps in Italy. Uh, and we'll serve several years there. And then uh, in 1952, we'll come to the United States. I mean, not sure what he wants to do. It's better than the sewers of Warsaw, I guess. The right? best decision of my life. <laughs> <laughs> best decision of his life. And uh, ends up at the University of Chicago where he completes his uh, PhD. Uh, and uh, will then uh, go on to be a uh, political science professor for the next 50 years uh, until he retired in 2015. And, is now an emeritus professor at the University of Texas, El Paso, and he's become a, a leading expert on borderland studies, uh, leading Polish-American intellectual, uh, you know, uh, and former vice president of the Polish-American Congress. But uh, you know, he's here today, though, as just a, an incredible, authentic voice of that piece. So first, uh, join me in welcoming Tony uh, today for this conversation. So, so, Tony, I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, I, someone may want to ask about uh, September 3rd and this, maybe the sense of betrayal, you know, with the, with the Allies. But I want to jump ahead and what was life like under the occupation uh, after uh, not just the German invasion, but then the Soviet invasion? Yeah. Uh, you're, you know, you're what, 13, 14 years old in, in Warsaw, and, and then... Um, how, what was that experience um, and, and the, those initial memories? Well, let me, let me share with you the idea that any, anybody fighting on the Western Front is a totally different experience because the Eastern Front in Central Europe, specifically in Poland, was a slaughterhouse. Out there, we were fighting not only for independence, democracy, and freedom, but obviously they were killing, trying to el eliminate, exterminate us. And the upshot of that was that in 
35 million Polish nation state existing in 1939 lost 6 million citizens. 90% uh, of the Jews, 3 million. You hear about the Holocaust, tragedy of Holocaust, and 3 million Christians, including my own mother. Uh, so uh, every fifth citizen of Poland died during World War II. And uh, just before uh, September 3rd, 1939, Poland entered into an agreement with France and, in and England that on the 15th day, two weeks from the beginning of the war invasion of Poland by the Nazis, there will be help coming from the, on the Western Front. Let me say also that on the Western Front, now we know that the Germans had smaller army than the French were. If they really attacked, probably loss of the French campaign would, be, would not happen next year because they will be, Germany will be fighting on two forces. Most of the forces they directed to Poland. And of course, on the, uh, as we know, on the 29th of August, 1939, secretly Stalin and Hitler signed an agreement deciding to partition Poland for the first time in history. Poland was partitioned and uh, half and half, 46% to Germany and uh, the rest, 46% 40, to Soviet Union and 54% to, to uh, Ger Germany. Um, this was secret and never revealed. It was the decision to attack by the Soviet Union in the back when the Polish army was fighting the Nazis was supposed to happen on the 15th day of the war. Uh, the Soviet intelligence through the agents in France discovered the date uh, but they still believed that the French, French and British might attack. And that's why they delayed two days and attacked us on the 17th of September 1939 from behind. So Poland was fighting two, on two fronts. We, we res on the Eastern Front, we resisted the Soviets. Initially, they were lying through propaganda media that, uh, that they are coming to help, actually, Pol Polish army. And, but, but they were fighting, obviously, uh, Germany for 32 days longer than France fought in World War II. Uh, then obviously came the terrible problem of re occupation of Nazi. It was brutality to the extreme. This was a really what I said, a slaughterhouse. Uh, suffices to say that uh, for every German we killed, we in, in the in the secret service, in the resistance movement, anybody who was killed by us, they executed hundred the poles taken at random from the buses or streetcars. And they were totally counting 97, 98, 99, 100. In one of the buses, I was 104. So I survived. And I can de 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 tell my story. Uh, my future wife was walking one day uh, on the street of Warsaw, led by hand by her American mother. And uh, and said, Mama, Mama, there is some paint on, on, the, on the pavement, and it was blood. It was execution because they were ex executing exactly 100 people on the streets, on the bus stop. So this was the beginning. In the October 1943 alone, uh, they killed 10,000 in public executions. First, in initially, uh, when the war started, I remember as a kid, I was 11 years old when the war started. Uh, I came to, the, to see the Germans, and I remember they started to be terrible brutality against Jewish citizens of Poland, beating them up, tor torturing them, and humiliating them. But also at the same time, they decided to immediately act against Polish intelligentsia, Polish leadership, Polish elite. And uh, in, in the Fall of 1939, they executed some thousands of people outside Warsaw. Leaders taken at random, people who were not politicians even, just simply important people in the, in the country of Poland. Suffice it to say again that one of those executed there was Janusz Kusociński, who won a golden medal in Los Angeles in 1932 Olympics for running 10 kilometers. He was an idol for the young people, so that's why they wanted to destroy that idol. So in a sense, in our resistance started immediately on the 27th of September 1939 when Warsaw capitulated because we lost 
20% of the city buildings and several thousand people and the mayor of the city of Warsaw, Staszynski, decided to help capitulate. And on that very day, Polish resistance movement started secretly by the officers of the Polish army, which later on became Armia Krajowa Home Army, led from London by the Polish government in exile, which first the Polish government was evacuated under the constitutional Polish state to Rum through Romania and France, and then a new government was formed in London, and then the government was recognized by every ally country in the world, and existed in London until 1945, when the, that was, uh, the governments for Poland were was not recognized from that moment, and, and the United States and, and England recognized communist government of so, Poland. So you're, ra you're racing ahead. Let's go back to 1943. In 1943. As, as, as you become active in this yeah. resistance organization, and you're selected to be uh, one of the heads of this uh, scouting organization. Yeah, yeah. So can you describe sure. some of that and why they chose you and what yeah. some of your experiences have been? Well, first of all, uh, the leadership of ev every organization and every organization was very young. 17% of the resistance movement was composed of women and people under 18. Uh, the Polish scouting organization, Szare uh, Szeregi, secret uh, ranks, gray ranks, ex existed with the, with the no, no more of the, it was a code name for the Polish uh, scouting units, and they recruited me at the age of 15. Uh, why they were so young? Because they, through execution, the leadership was younger and younger throughout the five years of nightmare of the, of the German occupation. And they also believed that the young people will better lead people will in better conditions with the young people. The, the scouting units uh, were divided into three, three groups. The youngest one were supposed to help out and become liaisons and spies for, in a minute I will exp explain the spying. And then there were another group over, over age of 18, they were, uh, they had office, they were training, military training, and of, up, from 18 up, the, those units were normal storm units of the Polish Home Army, Army Krajowa. They were the bravest of the bravest. Polish scouting units in the Warsaw Uprising, one of them, Radosław Battalion, out of 800 boys and, and, and girls, lost 600 men. Only 200 remained. I wanted to join them, but unfortunately, I didn't get there. But fortunately, because of that, I can tell you the story because I survived the Warsaw Uprising. So, so the youngest group was used later on. They wanted to save them. So they were used in field of field post office. You know, since so many young people disappeared from homes, uh, all, the, all the families were terrified. What happened to them? Where are they? So on the sixth day of the uprising, uprising incidentally was supposed to last only a week to 10 days and lasted 63 days. The uh, parents were terrified where these children are. are. And that's why the, on the sixth day of the uprising, uh, scouting units organized field office, post office, uh, and uh, we delivered 150,000 letters notifying where the kids are and if many of, of our post office young, youngsters died also from bullets of the Nazis also. So, so, so let me ask you, on the first day of the uprising, so um, you make a decision yeah. on the on Poniatowski Bridge. Uh, what can you describe the decision that you had to make uh, while you're, you're on your duties? Yeah, 10 days before the uprising. I didn't know that the uprising would occur. They because didn't tell you? They didn't tell you yeah, the uprising? They didn't tell me yeah. why, because they, I was commander of the boys, and they didn't want to mobilize the youngest kids under 16 in my, in my groups. But they gave me a, actually a spying order. They asked me to use all the hundreds uh, who, boys uh, on the Jerusalem Avenue, which is east, major east to west, Th Thoroughway Street through Warsaw, and the Germans were with withdrawing, and the new units were coming. At every bus stop, every street corner, 
I had somebody watching Germans and, or the, and remembering, trying to re report later on whether more Germans are coming and those who are withdrawing, when what moral, are they marching, are they from what units? The boys, amazing enough, knew what units they were from because we were teaching them actually those things. And uh, all along for about four miles across Warsaw, I had those hundred boys set up at every bus stop. And they were standing, support, supposing he's waiting for the next bus or street car. I had to change them every hour. At 2 p.m., Warsaw Uprising now was started at 5 p.m. during the rush hour. And this was at 2 o'clock, I got a telephone call that one of the boys cannot come to the uh, Washington roundabout on the east part of Warsaw. And I ran actually about two miles or three miles there and stood there for four to five. And this was beyond the Prince Poniatowski Bridge on the east side of Warsaw. And I didn't know the Warsaw Uprising could start in an hour. Uh, the next kid came at, at five. He came about 15 to five, and he, he stood for, for me, and I started walking through the bridge. Uh, friends of mine, an, an American general, said that this was the decision at the bridge in my life, and indeed it was. Had I turned west, I would join the uprising and stay in, in Poland, fighting uprising and then remaining in Poland, uh, probably visiting the United States as a guest. If I turn, uh, if, if I turn to the other way, I will probably end up in the communist army, which was still charging to Berlin and, and fighting in Berlin. Well, I turned in the direction of the West, where the Warsaw Uprising was, because my units were there, and uh, joined the, uh, actually uh, came to the, to the uh, two streets which are coming in that fashion, and there was a machine gun shooting on both streets, and I couldn't cross the street for about two hours. When I crossed the street, I joined the uh, Kribar Battalion, named after Commander, uh, Commander Stubb, girls, Christina and Barbara, Christina and Barbara. And Kribar Battalion captured Polish power station, Warsaw power station. And when I joined them, I expected to get some weapons. Unfortunately, I got two Molotov cocktails. Those were the only all the weapons I had, because they had, since they wanted to, uh, they started uprising also in the capital of Lithuania, Vilnius, and also fighting in Lviv, which is now the Ukrainian city attacked by Russia. Uh, and liberate those cities from the Germans. So mo a lot of weapons were sent there just before the uprising. And it was obviously only 10% of the people who joined the uprising had weapons. So I got those two, two bottles of Molotov cocktail and never, you know, the three days we didn't sleep. I was in the ruins of the high schools of, for art and uh, of art on the, on the border of Vistula River. And the third day, third night, we destroyed two tanks because the Germans were stupid enough to use tanks against uprising. They didn't realize that a little kid can come out of the cellar or uh, we were, in, I remember I was on the first floor in the ruins and they and throwing those bottles of Molotov cocktails. So this was the beginning of my, uh, my activity, <laughs> third day uprising. But on the next day, they sent me for more gas to bring from the third building. And I took another guy and a case like Coca-Cola for Coca-Cola bottles. And I was told to bring 24 bottles of uh, gasoline. And when I came back, everybody was dead except myself because the Germans changed from tanks to artillery. And it was artillery they were winning and, and killed the whole platoon. And at that point I decided to uh, jo rejoin the scouting units and ask for my commander to send me to the Radosov battalion, which was the bravest, uh, one of the bravest battalion in the Warsaw Uprising. But they were already cut off in the, on the district of Vola, and I would have probably never reached them or, or get killed there. So I joined for 10 days the post office. I became deputy commander of the post office, and we delivered those letters. But then the uprising started to be prolonged for 
two weeks, 10 days, two weeks, and all 10. So, so let me jump in really fast. Yeah. So, so for folks that, in terms of timing, as you recall, Alex yesterday was talking and Rob about uh, the, the Soviet, the Red Army's operation, migration, that it had, had really come near the outskirts of, of Warsaw. Yeah. And then whether because it culminated or because of policy or all of those reasons, you know, Stalin was happy to let the, the Nazi forces destroy the uprising that, uh, it, you know, that, that force. Uh, uh, the, the tragedy was that we didn't know the high command of the Armia Krajowa Home Army didn't know and Polish government didn't know that in November 1943, uh, in Tehran, uh, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin agreed that Poland is in the Soviet sphere of operation. And that's why the Soviets decided whether Americans can land, whether the Polish parachute brigade was trained to help us when the Americans came to throw us supplies, supplies in September. Uh, we thought it was a Polish parachute brigade which was directed to go to Holland and f f only one bridge too far in, in Holland, fighting for liberate Ho Holland, and we thought they were jumping to help us. Uh, so we, it was hopeless from the very beginning because nobody could hold, help us, and uh, the Soviet Union broke relations with the Polish government in exile after killing 20,000 Polish officers in Katyn forest who were prisoner of war from 1939. This was a vengeance of Stalin for uh, defeat of uh, Bolsheviks by Poles by Marshal Piłsudski in 1920 in Warsaw and independence of Poland. So, uh, so, so let me ask you, so, yeah. uh, so you're the deputy of the post office. You, you've got that for you know, uh, almost two weeks. And then, then what, what duties did you pick up? Well, this is, uh, he's, he's like a Swiss uh, Army knife. You notice he's yeah, got all these different yeah. functions through the... It was the, 15 days the, of the uprising. And after 15 days of uprising, people were initially euphoric, happy to have contact with their children. But after 15 days, they were starving. They were being killed. All the buildings were collapsing. They were bombing us every 15 minutes by Stuka bombers from the Warsaw airport picking up bombs and bombing us. So it was a nightmare. And at that point, very many people started complaining and uh, telling, you, you caused the uprising, and I didn't want to hear about it. So I went to the high command of the Armia Krajowa, and I said, literally what I said, I said, give me the most dangerous thing, but something I can contribute to. And they said, yeah, we'll find something like that. And General Bur Komorowski, commander of Armia Krajowa, sent an order uh, to be sent by messengers to leave Warsaw and ask all the partisan units of the Armia Krajowa, which was 350,000 strong, to march towards Warsaw and attack Germans from behind. Uh, they were supposed to send this, those orders through the, uh, to the radio, because we were led by, from London, strangely enough, by a radio when they were singing various songs, Polish, Polish songs on the BBC, those were orders for, the, for Armia Krova for the resistance movement. But since they were bombing us every 15 minutes and radio was not functioning very well, General Burkomorowski decided to find volunteers who will go outside of Warsaw, cross the German lines, and reach the partisan units. And I, I volunteered for that. At that time, Warsaw was divided into three districts. So we couldn't cross normally on the streets. I had to go to the sewers of Warsaw because three major thoroughfares were blocked, east-west thoroughfares were blo blocked for the German tanks to cross Warsaw during the uprising. So for about five miles, I had to go down, down to the sewers. And I was led by a, by a girl. They were young girls, usually 17, because they were slim and not very tall. We could, the, uh, sewers were one meter was, I had to bend, I remember. I have a photograph of myself from those days and, and I had to bend. And about, for about five miles, I crossed those uh, three, three times sewers and went to the, to the German territory. At that point, uh, the, I knew that I cannot walk normally because they were, so I decided to change the tactic and I started pretending to cry and I said, I'm looking for my mother 
But the Germans said, no, you are not looking for your mother. You are a courier for Armia Krajowa, for, for <laughs> underground. I smelled, and I didn't realize I smelled from the sewers. <laughs> so, so I reached the partisan yeah. units, and then they wanted me to stay in the partisan units. But I saw burning war, so I decided to come back, because I had to write a report. And those was a command, a report, of course, for a scout. It was an obligation. So I went back again to the sewers, back to the Warsaw, and I was assigned to another battalion which tried to capture Polish parliament. So, so let, let me, let me uh, question for you real quick. So, so first, when the, the Germans stop you, yeah. and, and you obviously smelled, the, uh, wh why weren't you shot? What, what, no, what no, happened? He, he, why, wh he, he took me under the guard and led me to a building outside the Royal Palace of Vilanov on the outskirts of Warsaw. And they, were, they put me right now, this uh, fa fashionable restaurant, uh, Vilanov. And there was a room, and in that room they had 30 uh, members of Armia Krajowa who attacked palace in Vilanov, and I wanted to capture the palace from the Germans the day before. And there was a German which, uh, in, the, in the window with an old, very old rifle, an old man of 70 or 75, and he was guarding us. And I spoke at that German because in the Polish schools were abolished immediately. Germans introduced uh, con conquered Poland. You, not only universities, but all the high schools, only grade schools uh, existed, fourth to fourth, fifth grade. But we had secrets, as uh, uh, Professor Ritchie said brilliantly yesterday, we had a secret state uh, with education, justice, everything, economy, etc. And I was studying secret high school, and I learned German from a German cooperating with us, not with Germans, with the Nazis, but with us. So I spoke German fluently. Started talking to the German, and he said, I'm an Austrian, I am not a Nazi, I cannot help you because they will kill me. But you have to escape, because if you don't escape, you will, they will shoot you in three days, maximum three days. And I managed, miraculously enough, miraculously enough to escape the third day, jumping into the cellar. They, led, they were leading us in a very narrow alley behind the palace, and it was dark, it was about 10 p.m., 11 p.m., and I just jumped into the cellar and, and went back to, to, to Warsaw. First, notifying, delivering the messages to the partisans, and the partisans couldn't help Warsaw because they didn't have machine guns, didn't have any weapons. Only 10% of the Warsaw uprising had weapons. So, so after 63 days, the the, there's an agreement that the, the, the Polish Home Army, Army in Warsaw is, is capitulated. Uh, capitulate, uh, and and you're you're uh, uh, surprisingly, I think as we think about it, they weren't just uh, either executed or, or shipped to death camps, but were actually treated as as prisoners of war. Yes. I know you went then to Stalag 10B. Can you? Can you describe that, yes, yes. that phenomenon as a prisoner? We're not, not only that, that we capitulated with the rights of the soldiers, because the uh, US government and British government on the 30th of August 1944 issued a memorandum through Switzerland to, to Germany that uh, there will be a reprisal against the uh, American and British uh, against Germans held in American and British camps, POW camps. And it worked, apparently. And they recognized us as the regular units of the Polish army and agreed to the capitulation. And they allowed us to walk out with weapons, even. We were depositing weapons at the, at the line, German lines. And even they were saluting. Yeah, see, that's, I, I find that pretty incredible, you know, that, that, uh, that, that you know, in, in the, the kind of character of the war in the East, that, that you're going to allow these, these to happen. Yeah. So, so then, can you describe uh, Stalag 10B and your experience there? It was a horrible Stalag. There were 30,000 POWs of 60 nationalities. Uh, they stopped feeding the Russians, so there is a cemetery at which there are 30,000, 23,000 Soviets, 7,000 Yugoslavs, and the rest are Poles. The cemetery. In, Stalag, Stalag, because this, they stopped feeding actually Russians totally about two weeks before the liberation by the Canadian army. Uh, it so, was, so can it you was, talk, talk about your liberation? Yeah, it was built on the marshes, and we were doing, digging ditches of some kind and really creating some hydroelectric system. Uh, 
and uh, food was terrible, rotten food. Uh, people were, had there was TV and disease sh spreading, and we were liberated on the 29th of April 1945, nine days after the birthday of Hitler. And of course, by that time, the Germans escaped from the camp and left us alone. And the Canadians came in. So what, what, was, what was your immediate feeling then? Well, the euphoria, obviously. Uh, some people just before, day before liberation, went on the, on the roof and, and, and they were shot, killed, some, because they were so happy of being liberated. And I saw a German escaping from the Canadian tanks, and he was younger than I was, probably. So I took pity on him, actually. I remember he was running to, trying to hide among us. But, you know, the Canadians were so scared that there would be diseases spread because this was a major problem. They said, no, you have to stay about six weeks, seven weeks under quarantine. And they, they replaced the Germans on the towers. And I said, no, under, definitely I'm not going to do that. So I escaped from liberated camp, Canadian from camp. From the Canadian camp. <laughs> I, what I did, I recruited three guys, four guys, and we went, we went to, on the highway and how to get to Holland. I wanted to get to sc scouting uh, uh, authorities, authorities in Holland. It was, we were on the Dutch border. And uh, what to do? Well, we have to take bicycles from the Germans, and there were Germans escaping on the bicycles. So we pretended we had weapons and put traditionally in Armia Krajowa home army style, we put our hands into pockets and pretended we had weapons. They had weapons, we didn't. <laughs> Logic, <laughs> lach Luckily, a Canadian, Canadian patrol came out and arrested the SS people who would be sh shooting us in a minute, it probably would kill us. So it was a lucky strike again. All my life it was a lucky strike, and that's why I'm able to talk to you. <laughs> at, so, least, at least five times I was ready, <laughs> almost dead. So, so um, it, it, and then briefly, I guess for about a month, you're part of this millions of displaced yeah. people that are are wandering about uh, Germany. Yeah. And then um, what happens next uh, with uh, the Second Corps? Well, first of all, Poland, apart from losing six million people, had two and a half million compulsory lab labor, which was captured and transferred to Germany, two and a half million. So there were two and a half million Poles alone, but altogether Germans captured eight million forced labor mostly Russians and all, all sorts of nationalities to fill the factories of Germany to fight us, to fight Americans, to fight British. So uh, this was an un unholy uh, situation in Germany, like a, you know, ant's nest, you know, everybody just t total chaos in Germany for about three we weeks, four weeks after liberation of the camps. And at that point, they, the first Polish armed, armed division captured Wilhelmshaven, a German naval base on the west of Germany on the border of Holland, and they wanted me to join them. But I said no, because my, my mother programmed me that I have to be a political scientist or a diplomat, and I'm supposed to study. <laughs> so, so I said, and I delivered that to Mama through University of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so uh, that's why I decided to escape. And then uh, I met a... British art, arist, aristocrat, who was a Polish lieutenant in the first, uh, uh, fresh, first Maciek division, first Panzer division, Polish Panzer division, which occupied Wilhelmshaven, and he took me to Paris. And I went, there was still Polish legal government, France still didn't recognize communist government, so there was a legal Polish embassy open of the government in exile in London. And um, Amb Ambassador Moravsky told me, you have to join the Polish army because you'll be still one of the two million refugees and completely helpless and hopeless. Uh, well, I... And, 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 and to jump in, if you didn't, it, there was a, the, the threat that you would then be sent to, uh, to the Soviet lines. Yeah, they wanted to send me, incidentally, in a minute I will tell you the, the, this story. So he said, I, I challenged him, I said, Mr. Ambassador, Your Excellency, but then I will be under command of the army, they will send me wherever they want to send me. And they did, I, finally I joined because I, his argument was stronger, obviously, and I wanted desperately to do something productive. 
So uh, I joined the Polish army in, in, under uh, French command initially, and they sent me to the camp in southern France. And in the southern France, a communist government was recognized by France early, and probably they wanted to please to create good relations with the communist government of Stalin or Russia, and they demanded that, they, that we should be handed over. Incidentally, that story nobody knows in, in Poland because historians didn't came on the story. My biographer introduced that story in my bio biography, which was published in English uh, la last year. And the French the, uh, were asked by the communist embassy or consulate, consulate in Nice, that we should be handed over to the communists as for burning Warsaw. And the Polish counterintelligence in contact with the British counterintelligence handed us over to the second Polish corps by simply coming in a jeep every, for five days with a jeep. We ca they came under the, te under the uh, tent and they covered us up and 10 people every day, 50 of us were evacuated to second Polish corps under British command in the British Eighth Army. So I became a British veteran, Polish veteran, British veteran. And now I'm a triple veteran. I'm also an American veteran. <laughs> So, so from there, you ended up in the in the Second Polish Corps in Italy and served in Italy for several years. Yeah. Uh, can can you briefly describe that that uh, occupation or post-war? Well, duty? they 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 were uh, de depleted after capturing Monte Cassino, and my regiment actually, the Twelfth Podolski Ulan uh, Regiment, captured Monte Cassino. I joined them after they captured Monte Cassino, and of course they they had terrible losses also. So the British High Command, Marshal Alexander, commander of the Eighth Army, British Eighth Army, suggested to Polish commander General Anders that the corps should be reduced to the division. He said, no, I will get sub supplies. Where from, he asked. Fr across the line from the Poles who were drafted forcibly by the Germans into, into Wehrmacht, into German army. And you see, when they captured half of Poland, they simply said, you have to serve in the Wehrmacht, or you, you will go to the concentration camp. So they preferred, very often they decided that it's a bad choice and they had to join under compulsion G German army. So the second Polish Corps was actually recruiting across the line. They were escaping from the G Wehrmacht on the German army and they were extremely well trained and still participated in, in various battles against the Nazis in the last days of war. And they were very devoted uh, obviously, because they, they had to serve in the German army for sometimes for a year or two years. So, so then, in, um, l before we open, one last one for you. So you came to the United States in 1952. Can you briefly tell us how did that happen? Well, uh, initially, initially, we were British didn't realize that they cannot demobilize our army. Polish army was the fourth largest army in the Allied bloc. There were 250,000 soldiers fighting all the fronts of the Western fr Front. But uh, uh, Br British realized that under the international law, we are soldiers of an independent country, Poland. So they decided to devise an act through which they, they simply said, you will join the British army and then we can demobilize you as a Britisher. That's why I'm a British veteran also. <laughs> so I was demobilized. I got one coat and two pairs of pants and uh, five, uh, five pounds, and this was my demobilization from the British Army. And I stayed in England for about six years. I started going to the evening classes, trying to test my English. And then on the sixth year, for about five, six years, I decided uh, several universities in, in the United States offer scholarships. And one, my organization to which I belong to the Polish combatants organization, servicemen organization with the recruiting we wrote letters to various universities and I decided to go to the United States. So uh, we're happy he did. So ladies and gentlemen, join me in a round of applause for Tony Kogiski. So now it's the, the uh, 
almost the speed, bait, speed, speed, speed dating portion, you know, where you get to ask him questions, and, and uh, I'll probably have to, to help him with, this, uh, with the, uh, the translation as we try to, try to hear what you said. But uh... Yeah, so uh, before we get to the first question, two points. One is we had the pleasure of hosting Tony here with his biographer in September. And when we were having lunch, he uh, was made aware of our conference. He said, oh, I think I'll come and speak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad he invited himself. That doesn't work for many people, but it worked for Tony. So thank you. The other point is uh, for hearing purposes, if you could try to keep your questions short, that would be helpful for the panelists, for Tony. Uh, we may repeat the questions so that they can hear more clearly. Thank you. We'll start with Connie in the back to your left, Tony. Anthony, that was one of the most gripping talks I have ever heard. And I wanted to ask you, what triggered the Warsaw Uprising? I'm assuming there was an event or a series of events, and also who made the decisions to trigger the Polish uprising? Well, the Warsaw Uprising was planned actually from the very beginning. And amazingly enough, to some extent, Germans were co caused the whole thing because they started terrible terror from the very beginning. So on the 27th day of September, Polish Home Army in 1939 was organized. And then, of course, uh, first they started beating up, torturing Jew Jewish people in the streets. Then they were shooting people, as I said, in the streets. All those executions. So every fifth Polish citizen died. Three million Jews, 90% of the Jewish population of Poland, three and a half million. And then, and three million Christians. My mother died in a German concentration camp, a Polish teacher. And, but personally, how much the citizens suffered, it was such a brutality. I lost my grandmother who was burned alive by the Rona, by the Wehrmacht units of the Russian uh, part of Wehrmacht. They boarded up the uh, old people's home and they burned all people alive. The second grandmother died, died also during the Warsaw Uprising and my mother in concentration camp. And two of my best friends died also, one Jewish friend. And we, my, my mother was a heroine uh, giving shelter to a, a Jew for four years, from 1939, 1943. Uh, Adam Tepper uh, lived with us and she was a heroine because every time we're biting nails with a Gestapo will come and kill. Poland was the only country in Europe which there was instant death for helping a Jew. Even a piece of bread was, was caused. And of course, helping, helping them to find housing. But my mother was on, uh, heroine enough to give him housing for four years. And on top of it, he, we thought that he was just simply trading in, trying to leave, he didn't want to go to the ghetto. But amazingly enough, he signed up in the Polish Army, Krajowa Home Army Officer School, and was a commander of the barricade in the Warsaw Uprising. When I, and I met him by sheer chance when I was going to the sewers. He was commander of the, of the barricade at Mokotowska 14 in, in Warsaw. And he died at that, at that uh, barricade three days later. I went into the sewers and outside to the partisan units, and he died because the German tanks attacked and destroyed that party. So that kind of constant brutality for five and a half of nightmare caused that in, there was uprising was caused, and everybody was preparing for an uprising. And especially that Armia Krajowa was extremely young. So we, we, wanted, we wanted to get even with Germans, and for every German, there were executed 100 people. So this is the story, why the uprising. And we wanted also to liberate Warsaw and, and welcome the Soviet Union, which was be, uh, just beyond the Vistula River, as rightful owners of the capital of Poland. Of course, that was, uh, to some extent, of course, we didn't know. Of course, that was sort of too many 
many people in Poland right now, uh, they feel like a betrayal that Roosevelt, Church, Churchill and Stalin assigned Poland, the first country which stood up to, the, to Nazi Germany, uh, assigned us to the Soviet zone. And that's why they, they simply didn't allow any help for Warsaw Uprising when we started fighting. But we expected initially that within two weeks they will help us because we will allow them cro cross the Vistula River, which is very wide at that point. It will be, the capital of Warsaw will be captured in, already in August but it was captured empty, completely empty city, co totally destroyed, 80% destroyed. Uh, in January, only they liberated the ruins of Warsaw in September 17, 1945. And we will go to the center halfway back. Sir, when you were speaking earlier about your youth in uh, Warsaw, if I heard you correctly, I thought I heard you say the girl that became your wife. I Did I hear that you. correctly? A girl that became your wife? Earlier you were talking about the girl that became your wife. Uh -huh. Yeah, that, that, that is correct. Well, you, my you, wife, huh? Yeah, how did right. how, how'd you meet your wife? How did that, how wife, did that happen? I met my wife in Chicago, typically, Polish city, the largest Polish city in, oh. in America. But, but, you, but, but did, you, did you meet her in the uprising? No, no. But, but there was another girl that helped you in the uprising. No, no, during the uprising, another girl saved my life because she, I was about to give, give up and die in the, in the sewers. And she said, you cannot die because you have to rebuild ha ha Polish scouting after the war. Well, that's so, such brave women were Polish girls. They were braver than men. Um, I w met my wife uh, in Chicago. Uh, how? I, was sign I signed up for the University of Chicago and I was obviously penniless and hungry. So I went to see my friend who op opened the store in Chicago after we arrived in Chicago. And he employed my, my future wife uh, there to do accounting. And she was, this was I went there to eat something because I said, well, he obviously will be eating lunch, but he, I, he wasn't in the shop. She was there and she was eating pizza. And instead of talking to her, I ate her pizza. <laughs> and, she, and she immediately said, well, a crazy friend of you came and ate my pizza and even do, didn't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> we married him one year later on. <laughs> She died at first 25 years ago. It was a God-given gift by God to me, really. She's a fantastic woman. Since we didn't have children, we decided to give all the money we have, all the money I saved for scholarships in, in the American colleges. I gave 16 scholarships at the University of Texas, uh, three prof endowed professorships at the University of Texas, and also University of Warsaw. The, tot the total was 600,000, which I got as, as an executor from a friend of mine and another five, 500,000 from our savings. That's great. Tony, uh, the next question is with Connie to your left. Tony, uh, thank you for your service. Um, I wanted to ask you, as all of us are following the news and what's going on in Ukraine, what parallels do you see from your experience, or what lessons can we on Ukraine, yeah. gather from your experience? Well, uh, obviously, Ukrainians are fighting exactly for what we were fighting in World War II. Freedom, democracy, nation state, existence. Even more so than Poles, because Poles were lost the country, were divided in 1795, and for 123 years, uh, Poles didn't have a nation state. Poland was not on the map of, of the world. And my generation, my, my mother's generation, my father's generation recovered Poland in World War I, thanks to America, Woodrow Wilson, obviously, who was instrumental in pr promising Poland in the 13th point, which was put by his advisor, Colonel House, uh, House of uh, Texas, of Austin, Texas, where I live now, right now. 
<laughs> so um, that's the story of, of uh, um, Ukrainians are fighting. Obviously, the, the, it's extremely difficult, especially since this Soviet army, uh, those of us, not only political scientists, but former soldiers like myself, we expected that, that Ukraine will be conquered in a couple of days by the supposedly big army, well-trained army of the Russian Federation. And we see that almost a year after, Ukrainians are fighting for their country. Why? Because they want to recover the independence, their own country, Ukraine. And this is true especially since Ukrainians were fighting three times, first against the Tartars in 13th century, then against the Poland, in, in, when Poland occupied Ukraine in the Khmelnytsky uprising in the 17th century, and then Petlura government uh, in World War I, and three times in, in World War I also didn't get, they got independent Ukraine for three years, and then they were conquered by Bolsheviks, by Russia. So obviously they deserve a country, and nobody has any right to take away nation state and the, the, their own country. So they are fighting, and that's why the Ukrainian army is stronger in defending, U fighting for Ukraine after almost a year right now. So I, I hope it will, like, obviously they have to be held by us with weapons and, uh, we sh and, sh and shield the refugees also. Uh, Poland did its share. There were four million Ukrainians housed in Poland as refugees. Right now, I talked to the chief statistical office in Warsaw, and two million of the refugees went back to Ukraine because they left their mothers, their grandparents, and, and they are worried about housing in, in those cities which are mercilessly bombed by the Soviets, by the Russians. But I do believe that eventually they will win, but we have to help them. We cannot stop because we have to introduce eventually democracy in Russia. Russia deserves democracy. Russia deserves, after 800 years, a democratic government. And of course, what they are doing is criminal, invading another country. Thank you, Tony. If I may, um, you mentioned helping. Uh, we are always helped by our friends here, and one of those dearest friends actually introduced us to you, Dr. Alexandra Ritchie, is how we uh, made your acquaintance on one of the tours that she leads through Germany and Poland. Uh, Alex, who is here with her daughter, Max, to her left, uh, they have actually taken in uh, a few Ukrainian refugees as they're getting into Poland. Um, Alex teaches a lot of Ukrainian students and has worked with them to get their families out. So it takes a lot of people, and Alex is helping uh, a lot of people. So thank you to Alex for that. It, it, If, if, I could, if, Jeremy, if I could mention yes, real quick too, uh, you know, apparently there's, a, there's about 6,000 people that are watching this online. Uh, my math may be a little off, but, uh, but to include uh, Tony's friends uh, back in Warsaw. And so they're, they're monitoring this as well. So, so the, the, the message doesn't just stay here, it actually uh, resonates uh, around the world. So go ahead. Thank you. And the next question will be in the front in the center aisle, please. Very good. When you lived in Great Britain, I know 150 Polish pilots fought in the Battle of Britain. I wonder if you ever met any of the Polish pilots that fought in the Battle of Britain when you were in England. Yes, I met. It's not generally known that the Kosciuszko Squadron 303 was the squadron which, in the Battle of Britain, shut down 12% of all the Nazi planes. And I indeed, I, I met, so Churchill at that time thanked Poland for saving London. And, 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 and uh, Edward Newman wrote a book, They Saved London. But unfortunately, in 1945, United States and the United Kingdom recognized communist government for Poland because Poland was assigned to the Soviet sphere of Central Europe, and, uh, and the Polish 
army, quarter of a million, the fourth larger army after Canadians. Uh, they were not marching in the parade in 1945. So you feel that we were really crying. I was crying when I was, for the first time when I was an exchange professor from Texas to study, to, to teach in, in London in 1990, they repeated the parade and at that time I started crying because at that time, for the first time, when the Soviet Union collapsed, they allowed uh, Poles to march by that time 40 years older people who were supposed. Fiji was marking, marching, all the colonies of Great Britain. The only country which wasn't marching on the parade of victory in London was Poles, after losing six million citizens and three million Christians. And there's a great book on that unit um, by Lynn Olson, who was here. It's called The Question of Honor. The next question is going to be to your left with Connie, please. Thank you, Tony Jankoye. I have a million questions to, to ask to you, but I'd like you to comment or on the symbol you have in your color, please, uh, how they made it and how important it is. Your, your little symbol about the... Right. The symbol on your lapel. Yeah, the, pin, oh, yeah. the pin on your collar, please. Uh, this sign on my lapel is PW, uh, which means uh, Polska Walcząca, Fighting Poland. And that was designed by there was a competition in the underground. And the student of the School of Art invested. This is an anchor. And PW means Polska Walcząca. Uh, but at the same time, it's a symbol of hope. And this is a symbol for the Polish Home Army, and I've been wearing that for the last 80 years on the lapel in, to honor my friends who died in the Warsaw Uprising. Because when I go back to Warsaw from America, from El Paso, Texas, where I live, I always see, here lies Mary, there lies Johnny, all my friends who died during the Warsaw Uprising. My commander died the first day of the uprising, and I had to dig his grave the first day of the uprising. And we were burying him in the sidewalk, lifting the cement and burying him down there. So uh, Warsaw became a ghost town, a ruins, city of ruins. There's a fantastic movie made by the Museum, Museum of Polish Uprising in of Warsaw Uprising in Warsaw, uh, showing the photographs of ruined Warsaw. By, it's a photograph taken by the American plane right after the war in 1945. It's a complete ruin. 80% of buildings. And now it's a city of skyscrapers. Half of Warsaw was rebuilt in medieval style, style from photographs of the, which they found in paintings in Dresden. Uh, German king from Saxony was a Polish king in, in the 18th century. And they, they were paintings of Warsaw and they repainted from this, those paintings that they rebuilt completely city, so part of city looks exactly like those paintings of the 17th century. And the rest looks like Chicago. There was, <laughs> <laughs> there, there was, there was one skyscraper named uh, Stalin, and now there are about 60 skyscrapers. <laughs> because they want to cover up the Soviets, uh, to be taller than the Soviet skyscrapers. <laughs> That's the spirit of Poland. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a round of applause for Tony Krzyzewski. What a remarkable man and story. Thank you very much.